one of Jesus' hardest teachings to, to live out, no doubt, is the one to love our enemies and to pray for those who uh, give us a hard time. Tough stuff. And it's really, I guess, where the rubber meets the road in following Jesus. There's an old saying that goes like this, If thine enemy wrong thee, buy each of his children a drum. Well, makes sense if you think about it. Uh, there was a farmer who raised sheep. Next to his farm was another farm that raised wheat, children, and large dogs. The dogs made the sheep's lives miserable by scaring them to death all the time. And the sheep farmer really didn't know what to do about it. Uh, he could shoot the dogs, or maybe poison the dogs. He could be really nasty to his neighbor, maybe even take him to court, sue him, that kind of thing. But he was a believer, and so he prayed about it. And then he did this. As soon as he had some new lambs that were born, he gave each one of his neighbor's children's children, uh, one of the new lambs, as a pet. The children, of course, were thrilled, but their father could no longer allow his dogs to run wild as he had all along, so he restrained them for the sake of the pet lambs and his children. And over time, the two farmers became friends. I tell that story not to suggest that a method like that always works with somebody who's acting like a jerk or somebody who's an enemy or an opponent, but to show the truth that, that dealing with enemies calls for spiritual wisdom and that there is an art to answering enemies. And that's something that we definitely can learn from Nehemiah as well. I want us to begin in the fourth chapter of Nehemiah today, just the first six verses um, reading there, and then we will get into our thoughts for this particular study. Nehemiah 4 begins, Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what they are building is. If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Well, last time in our study, uh, we looked at chapter 3, and in chapter 3 there was this sort of celebratory tone. Um, remember all the, the people from all different walks of life, high and low, rich and poor, had come together to build the wall of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. And, and so they did in 52 days. Quite an incredible feat. But here in chapter 4, we learn some of the difficulties that they faced as they worked. Um, no, it was not an easy project, and not just physically. Uh, they were challenged in many ways. There were serious enemies who opposed them. There were people in power 
who were pushing agendas to keep them from their goal. And behind it all, as, as always, I think it's clear, was the evil one, the great opponent of God's work. We mentioned in one of the earlier studies that, that there had indeed been a previous attempt to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem several years before this one. It's told about in the book of Ezra, and chapter 4 of that book. And that effort, that attempt, was stridently opposed as well. Um, lies were told about the workers. The project was brought to a standstill because of it. And really, Satan won, Satan won that round. But now this new effort... Uh, has arisen in Jerusalem, and you have this new leader, Nehemiah, that oversees the work, and as we read a moment ago, the people had a mind to work. Now the fact is that the work of God in this world will never go far if the people of God do not have that kind of mind, a mind to work. So we see here in chapter 4 of Nehemiah, the, the wicked tactics of the opponents, men like Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, all of whom were protecting their own interests, their own power bases, all of whom were really doing the devil's work. And, and why do I say that? Well, if you look back at chapter 2 of the book in verse 10, we learn what it was that really upset these guys. When, when you come right down to it, it says there, it displeased them greatly that someone, someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Isn't that ugly? They just hated that good things might happen to the people of God. That is really of the evil one. And, you know, I guess there's always people like that, and even today, who will, who will tolerate the people of God just so long as not much good comes from what they're doing. Um, as long as they can keep the people of God under their thumb and under their control. But as soon as they start to see truly good things, as soon as they see the work of God advancing and the people of God being blessed, and being a blessing, they will try to put a stop to it. And they will have the full support and inspiration of the great adversary, Satan. And they might well begin their attack the same way that these people did, with ridicule and mocking and laughing and making fun. Did you notice um, that tactic? As, as they began their attack in, in the opening verses of this chapter, saying things like, what are, the, what are these feeble people up to now? Building a wall? And, you know, you're going to be finished by tonight? Going to do something different tomorrow? Your wall is full of holes. Even if a little animal crawled up on it, it would crumble to pieces. Ridicule. That's how it starts. And unfortunately, sometimes that's all it takes to stop a good work from progressing. But not in this case. Um, in this instance, the people do what they had learned from Nehemiah to do. What was that? They, they turned to God. They sought God in prayer. And, you know, it's not as if they didn't hear the laughter and, and feel the scorn. They most certainly did, but they turned it into prayer, and they told God about it. So you look at verses 4 and 5 and see this. Uh, not a bad response to this kind of attack, and we need to remember that. When, when the hateful words of the enemy come against us, we need to turn our focus to God. Give it first to God and let him deal with it. 
And really, that's about all it takes to defeat this tactic. Uh, the tactic of ridicule is to take it to God. It's one of those burdens that Jesus willingly bears for his people. And he's the one who showed how it was done as he suffered the cross. Remember, they mocked him. Uh, they, they spat upon him. They insulted, laughed at him. And what did Jesus do? He prayed. Uh, and so he defeated that tactic, and so can we. Uh, so did the people in Nehemiah's day. Unfortunately, that's not the only tactic. And uh, it's only the first one used here. And so I want to read on in, in chapter 4, beginning at verse 7, and see what happens next. But when... Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So, in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Isn't that an amazing turnaround? Um, let me see here uh, the second and third tactics of the enemy. First, there's this threat of an attack. And, and the enemies plan to bring a a force against Jerusalem and, and make them stop the work. Now remember that the population of the city is not yet very large. Uh, they don't have a standing army. Um, this is a real threat, and it has some effect, as you can imagine. Uh, verse 10, verse 12, some of the workers are getting a little squeamish. So how do they respond? Again, uh, verse 9, and we pray to our God. Always the first response is to turn to God when there's an attack. And so I hope we really internalize that particular lesson as we look through this book. Always the first response is to turn to God. But it doesn't end there. That's not all. We've learned from from Nehemiah, this pattern, prayer and then action, right? Prayer and then action. So they pray to their God, verse 9, and then what do they do? It says they set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Yes, there was something for them to do. Pray? Absolutely. But then do the sensible thing. People were threatening them with force of arms, so they set a guard. They took a stand. Well, I think sometimes we forget the example of Jesus in, in these things. You remember that when Jesus was arrested in the garden, Peter whipped out a sword, right? And he actually struck one of the enemies that came out 
uh, with that sword, and Jesus very uh, promptly rebuked Peter, and he healed the man whom Peter had struck with the sword, whom you know, he had in injured. But did you ever wonder or think about why Peter had a sword in the first place? Uh, go back and read Luke chapter 22, and in particular verses 35 through 38. And you will see that Jesus told the disciples, as the time approached for his arrest and, and his crucifixion, uh, to take a sword with them. Now, he didn't intend them to use that to prevent him from going to the cross, to prevent him from being arrested. And so that's why he rebukes Peter when he attacks uh, the servant of the high priest, Malchus. But uh, he, he tells them to take a sword for some reason, probably to protect themselves in those days leading up to uh, these events uh, from the enemies that were out there, who no doubt were trying to kill not only Jesus, but, but the disciples. There is nothing inherently ungodly or unspiritual about self-defense. The people of Israel prayed when they were threatened. Yes, they prayed. And they prayed first, but they also set a guard. And you better believe those guards were armed. Well, tactic number three that, that's revealed to us here of the enemy was the surprise attack. Um, it wasn't a, a frontal assault, but a surprise attack. And it's referred to in verse 11 of Nehemiah 4. And again, there it quotes the enemies as saying, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. So probably this was going to be some type of terroristic, guerrilla-like warfare. Uh, you know, they sneak in, they slaughter some folks, and and then everyone gets discouraged and the work falls apart. That was the goal. What does Nehemiah do in response? He strengthens the defenses. He increases the arms. And most importantly, it says this in verse 14, Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Now this was serious business that they were involved in. It was important. They had real enemies, and it demanded a real response. And I think we were tempted to think, oh, that's an ancient time and an ancient way. But I wonder, we, do we have no enemies today? And if we don't, is it perhaps because we're not doing enough to get their attention? There is an enemy today. There are battles. And in truth, warfare rages around us. The New Testament declares this. Remember these words that were written for Christians? Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the enemies and the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So yes, there are threats, and they're real. There are attacks. There is armor to wear, and there is wrestling to do. Well, let's finish our story from Nehemiah's time before we 
finish our reflection on what it means for us. Again, we're in chapter 4 of Nehemiah, beginning down in verse 15 now. It says this, When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held their spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah. People uh, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles, and to the officials, and to the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you, you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. It's really a fascinating chapter to me. Interesting, isn't it, how they went about their work? Um, imagine a, a trowel in one hand and in the other a sword. Um, did they pray to and trust their God? Yes, certainly. Verse 4, verse 9, verse 14, verse 20. Uh, they, they clearly affirm the truth. Our God will fight for us. But also, they kept their weapons close. Verse 16, verse 18, and verse 23. They prayed and they acted, you see. This was, again, serious business. This was the very work of God that was being threatened. And I wonder, are we as concerned with the work of God today? Um, I wonder sometimes how concerned God's people are today with God's work. It seems easy at times to discourage God's people from coming together to sharpen their swords. What do I mean? What swords? Uh, do we get swords today? Yes. In fact, they're double-edged ones. We get swords that pierce to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. That is the Word of God. Uh, it is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword that man ever built. And so, how many of you are wearing your sword? How many have it handy? How many of you regularly sharpen? That is, increase your knowledge of the Word of God. You see, we have enemies too. Our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And, and what is it that we have to stand against him and to, to confront his allies? For the Christian, there are, are more enemies in this world than friends. 
So let's keep in mind these words. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. These are our weapons.